I'm calling to order this hearing. This is a public hearing, technically a round table under the council's rules by the Committee of the Whole. I'm Phil Mendelson, Chairman of the Council and Chair of the Committee of the Whole. Today is Wednesday, April 7th, 2021. The time is 9.38 in the morning and we are conducting this hearing virtually over the Zoom video conference platform. Uh, it's available to the public over the chairman's website, which is www.chairmanmendelson.com slash live, or the council's website, www.dccouncil.us, is being broadcast on council channel 13. And the subject of today's, this morning's hearing is consideration of two nominations for appointment by the council of representatives on behalf of the district government or the District of Columbia to the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. Um, they are PR 24-89, Board of Directors of the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, Lucinda Babers, Appointment Resolution 2021, and PR 24-93, Board of Directors of the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, Thomas J. Bulger, Alternate Member Reappointment Resolution of 2021. The stated purpose of PR 24-89 is to appoint Ms. Lucinda Babers to the Board of Directors of WMATA for a term to end June 30th, 2023. And the stated purpose of PR 24-93 is to reappoint Thomas Bolger to the WMATA Board of Directors as an alternate member for a term to end June 30th, 2024. The Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority is a regional instrumentality created through an interstate compact between the Commonwealth of Virginia, the State of Maryland, and the District of Columbia to plan, develop, finance, and operate a regional transportation system in the Washington Metropolitan Area. The WMATA Board serves as the governing body for WMATA and is composed of principal directors and alternate directors appointed by the Council as well as by the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission, the Washington Suburban Transit Commission, and the Secretary of the United States Department of Transportation. The purpose of this morning's hearing is to provide an opportunity for public comment, as well as to receive testimony from the appointees, the nominee, nominated appointees. As to the fitness of the proposed not, uh, nominee or proposed appointees to the, for the WMATA board. Uh, we have several witnesses who are not the nominees, and then we will hear from the nominees themselves. I want to note that the record in this matter will close at 5 p.m. on Monday, April 19th, 2021. That's not a full two weeks. The committee may take up these nominations at its next meeting on April 20th. Uh, so let's hear testimony from Dan Tangerlini, who's listed as a public witness, Neil Albert, who's listed as uh, with the downtown, uh, downtown DC Business Improvement District, and Ron Thompson, who's listed as representing or being from the DC Transportation Equity Network. Sometimes I put folks on a clock. I don't think I'll do that today, given the number of witnesses. However, there is a clock, so you can see how much time you are taking. And we'll begin with Mr. Tangerlini. Good morning. It's good to see you. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you, Chairman Mendelson. Uh, uh, I also appreciate other members of the committee, the whole other attendees and those that are watching uh, being here this morning. It's an honor and pleasure to offer this testimony today in favor of the nomination of Lucinda Babers for the board of the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, also known as WMATA or Metro. I'm Dan Tangerlini, a resident of Ward 6. Lucinda and I have worked on and off with each other since 1999, when she worked for the city's council, city uh, uh, council, uh, control board appointed chief management officer. And I was serving with the office of the chief financial officer. We later worked together again in the Williams and Fenty administrations uh, in her roles as both the deputy and later director of the Department of Motor Vehicles, DMV. Most recently, I had the good fortune to co-chair the Mayor's Reopen DC COVID Response Task Force's Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure with her. Many of the ideas we put forward in that report, you can actually find echoed in the President Biden's recently released infrastructure proposal. 
In every chance I've had to work with Lucinda, I've found her to be unflinching in her focus, hard work, and ethics. She's also creative and collaborative. These qualities and others she possesses will make her an excellent addition to the WMATA board. Her intense focus on customer service, metrics, and cost will serve WMATA and the region well as she joins the board at a critical time in Metro's history. While Lucinda's recent work as the Deputy Mayor for Operations and Infrastructure brings her a wealth of understanding of the challenging capital and operating expense structure of WMATA, her most relevant and useful experience might actually come from her time at DMV. The DMV is a high volume, highly complex operating environment that needs to provide service every day, similar in many ways to the challenges of delivering much needed transportation services in the Washington metropolitan region. She's managed hundreds of people, had to make long-term capital improvement plans and provide high quality service in a timely way. In this work, Lucinda excelled and became nationally known in DMV circles for her innovations and improvements. When we worked together when I was city administrator, Lucinda embraced the idea that the best trip to the DMV is the one you never have to take. She was among the agency heads who led the charge to the web so that customers could get their work done when they were free not just when the DMV was open. Another example was eliminating the biannual safety checks, which were found to be completely unnecessary. There was no linkage to the checks and safety. Eliminating those checks, rationalizing the emissions inspection process, including adding self-serve kiosks, returned hundreds of hours of time to DC residents. I fully expect Lucinda to bring that same level of commitment to riders and employees in her service on the WMATA board. Metro's excellent general manager, Paul Wiedefeld, deserves a board member who understands the challenges of an actual operating environment, is skilled in managing political processes, and has deep experience in municipal financial management. With Lucinda Babers on the WMATA board, you'll have such a partner. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Tangerlini. Uh, Mr. Albert. Good morning, Chairman Mendelson. Thank you for the time. My name is Neil Albert. And I'm the president and CEO of the Downtown DC Business Improvement District. I am here today appearing before you to express my support for the appointment of Deputy Mayor Babers as a principal member of the Board of Directors for the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. As the head of the Downtown DC bid for the past five years and a former member of the WMATA board myself, I'm keenly aware of the experience necessary to effectively serve as a WMATA board member to advocate for our city and the unique challenges and opportunities currently facing our region due to the pandemic. In addition to my service on the WMATA board, I served as in several capacities in the District of Columbia, including working with Dan Tangalini uh, in the Fenty administration and following him as a city administrator for Mayor Fenty. During my time in DC government, I had the pleasure of working with Deputy Mayor Babers, mostly as she led the transformation of the Department of Motor Vehicles from a much maligned agency to a model agency in both the DC government and the country. At the DMV, Lucinda implemented strategies that dramatically reduced wait times, moved many processes to the internet, made a DMV to the extent that it could be a more inviting place to visit, raised the level of professionalism for her team and continuously drove innovation. Lucinda positioned the DC DMV well ahead of her peers around the country. I've also been privileged to work with Ms. Babers in her current role as she assisted many downtown businesses utilize the city's infrastructure like sidewalks and streets to expand their footprint to serve their customers safely during the COVID-19 pandemic. Lucinda has very little tolerance for bureaucracy and her thoughtfulness and impatience for our necessary processes contributed to many retailers and restaurants being able to pivot so quickly to cope with the fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic. Since March, 2019, Ms. Babers has served as the Deputy Mayor for Operations and Infrastructure, where she has oversight of over 3,000 employees, $651 million in operating funds, $1.9 billion in capital funding, and over $5 million in rev $500 million rather in revenue. Her experience in managing complex projects and tasks, communicating with diverse communities, leading and participating in teams effectively, problem solving and fiercely advocating for the residents of DC make her the ideal WMATA board candidate. In addition to her experience with DC government, 
Ms. Bieber served in senior management positions at Amtrak and her active participant participation rather on the board of directors of the Union Station Redevelopment Corporation and as an alternate for the board of the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments has helped prepare her for effective service on the WMATA board. So for all the reasons I've articulated earlier, I am confident Deputy Mayor Babers will be a key asset to the board of the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. I'm confident that she will serve as an important voice and advocate for our city in preserving and overseeing this vital transportation network. I commend Mayor Bowser for nominating Deputy Mayor Babers to this role. And I would like to restate my wholehearted support for her appointment as a principal member of the board of directors. I thank you for the opportunity today and welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Albert. Uh, I will probably have some questions for you and Mr. Tangerlini and uh, maybe Ron Thompson after his testimony. Uh, so the next witness is Ron Thompson, who's with the DC Transportation Equity Network. Good morning, Chairman Mendelson. And apologies for keeping my uh, camera off. I have a pimple that is very ugly. So I will be just talking about my camera on. Uh, my name is Ron Thompson. Well, greetings, Chairman Mendelson and members of the council. My name is Ron Thompson, policy officer at Greater Greater Washington and organizer for the DC Transportation Equity Network. I provide this testimony in capacity with DC 10 on behalf of his membership. Um, this is my testimony as long as I'm gonna try to keep it brief within the time that I have. I would like to thank you, Chairman Mendelson, for convening this public roundtable on the appointment of Deputy Mayor for Operations and Infrastructure, Lucinda Babers, as a principal member, uh, to the um, as a principal member, and the reappointment of Mr. Tom Balder as a alternate member to the Washington Metropolitan Area Transportation Authority uh, Board of Directors. The district having full representation at Metro is incredibly important to DC 10 and its members. The appointment of Deputy Mayor Babers as a principal member uh, to the Metro board would mean that after two years, the district would finally have two voices participating in the oversight of the region's chief transit agency. We also recognize the significance of Ms. Babers' appointment to the board. Two black women will represent the district at the region's chief transit agency as principal members. We encourage the council and mayor to ensure that the district's appointment to the WMATA board represent the diversity of Metro's riders, but also the diverse needs that must be considered at Metro. The interests of labor, riders with disabilities, low-income riders who make up the majority of Metro bus riders and other marginalized and vulnerable uh, interests deserve to have their concerns represented on the board. We understand that we cannot simply increase transit service, especially bus service, without ensuring that we have the infrastructure that allows transit to move efficiently, frequently, and reliably. We also understand that simply reducing the cost of transit would have little effect if we do not ensure that riders have sufficient access to transit. The appointment of, deputy, uh, of the deputy mayor for operations infrastructure to the board would mean that the mayor's point person will coordinate in DDOT, DPW, and DOEE, agencies critical to the improvement of transit service and reliability, can ensure that district policies and investments are aligned with those made at WMATA. It is our hope that Deputy Mayor Babers will use her deep knowledge of how to make agencies work to ensure that DC and WMATA are working hand in glove to improve transit operations for all Washingtonians, but especially for our most vulnerable and marginalized residents. Should Deputy Mayor Babers be confirmed, we ask her to prioritize three areas, increasing afford affordability, protecting and expanding transit services in the district and improving reliability. On affordability, while our ultimate goal is to see, the fare, to see fares for low-income riders be subsidized or eliminated altogether, we believe there are immediate steps that can be taken to reduce strain on cost for the riders. Eliminating the fee for transfers from bus to rail and rail to bus, more commonly referred to as the transfer penalty, reduce, would reduce the cost of transportation for district residents who do not live in close proximity me to metro stations. The Washington Area Bus Transformation Proce Project also recommended eliminating the transfer penalty as part of its recommendations on improving the rider experience and increasing ridership. Eliminating the transfer penalty will reduce transportation costs for cost burden households and make riding the bus more convenient for, pe for more people. Um, while it is not clear what service will look like as on rail as the region returns to work, WMATA has proposed normalizing rail frequency by any peak and off-peak service. In the notion of metro roads, a commuter rail system would be incredibly beneficial, but this proposal, as it currently stands, does not normalize fares. That is, the proposal does not 
eliminate peak and off-peak pricing. For an equitable normalized rail system, we must address fares. Should she be appointed, we ask Deputy Mayor Babers to push the agency to adopt a normalized schedule and fare structure. And I, there's more, but I see that I'm out of time. And I, I, my, I provided my written testimony to uh, the committee and I have I'm willing to answer any questions. Uh, but Mr. Thompson, um, I'm not cutting you off. So if you wanna oh. complete your statement. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, on improving and expanding transit service, should Ms. Babers be confirmed, our asks are simple. Year after year, we see deep bus cuts in the district proposed by WMATA. We ask the Deputy Mayor Babers join with Ms. Gittaby and reject any reduction and bus service in the district. While we understand the nuances of streamlining lines and eliminating stops, we also know what a service, a service elimination is. We oppose the latter. We also echo Mayor, Mayor Bowser's call to restore late night rail service. Restoring late night rail service will ensure that residents and workers who do not work traditional hours have a reliable way home and keep the district's economy running. We encourage Deputy Mayor Babers to push WMATA to find a truly collaborative solution with organized labor at the table to bring late night service back in a way that does not undermine safety or regular maintenance. We also ask Ms. Babers to support the work of the WMATA Riders Advisory Council, the Accessibility Advisory Committee, and the Metro Transit Police Department Investigations Review Panel. In closing, we look forward to seeing Deputy Mayor Babers appointed and Mr. Balger reappointed to the Model Board of Directors. Ms. Babers' appointment will bring leadership at the agency closer in line with what with Metro's ridership looks like, as well as bring a much needed link between the district and regional transportation policy. We invite Ms. Babers to a meeting of the DC-10 and look forward to working with her in the future. Thank you all for the opportunity to testify. Oh, thank you, Mr. Thompson. Uh, you know, Mr. Thompson, you touched on this in your testimony, and I read the article that you posted in Greater Greater Washington. Um, the um, the fact that we did not have two primary members for a couple of years was intentional on my part. I thought we were well represented by the uh, folks that we had, and uh, I believe that. Uh, Mr. Marudian attended most of the meetings as an alternate. Uh, so I just want to be clear that that was intentional. Um, I wanted to ask some questions of Mr. Tangerlini and Mr. Albert. Uh, I'll start with Mr. Tangerlini, a simple question. I don't think we have a copy of your statement. It would be nice if we had that for the record. I, I submitted it to the council, the whole website, but I'm happy to do it again if, uh, if that didn't happen. I'm looking to see whether we got it and I'll be told in a minute. Um, I can I can resend it. No, problem. no we have it. Um, Mr. Tangerlini, you were on the Metro board at one point? I was from 2004 to 2006. And then you were general manager, weren't you? Yes, for uh, nine months in 2006. I was the interim general manager. And Mr. Albert, you were never the general manager, but you were on the board, weren't you? I was on the board, sir, yeah, never the general manager. Um, and what years were you on the board? 2008 to 2010. Because I want to ask each of you about um, the challenges that the district has with WMATA, since you both have been there. Um, challenges like how we hold our own vis-a-vis uh, -vis our regional partners who are on the board or um, what we can be doing to better improve, what the board can be doing to better improve uh, transit, public transit for the district, whether we're talking about rail or bus. Um, I just would like you to speak a bit to that. This is an opportunity to kind of get into those issues and not just simply talk about the nominees. Uh, who wants to go first? Uh, I'm happy to uh, start and then and then let Neil give you a better answer. Uh, but um, I think it is one of the most interesting challenges of the way the, the board is organized with two uh, surrounding uh, jurisdictions and, and then just the district. Sometimes it felt that, that things could get two to one uh, when when you were dealing with issues, I would say though over 
over the last decade or so, as the surrounding uh, jurisdictions have urbanized and realized then the value of a strong transit system, that there's been a stronger coalition within the board for the kind of inner jurisdictions and, and the outer ones. As Virginia invested in the silver line, they also saw the value then of uh, bringing along the District of Columbia and supporting uh, efforts for, for reform and changes there. But, but I will tell you, in things like late night service, um, expanded service, fair, um, uh, you know, creating a more equitable, fair structure, these were always challenges. And, um, you know, figuring out how to fund Metro in general has been a consistent challenge since it, 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 it launched, the, the rail launched in 76. So um, I, I think that, that you're, you're hitting on a very important issue and I think it's why it's so important to have talented, skilled, and experienced folks on the board, um, uh, like Lucinda and Tom, uh, who can build those relationships and, and manage the process long term in trying to evolve a more equitable regional transit system. Yeah, I, I think uh, Dan sort of summed it up, you know, the dynamics, political dynamics of the board could sometimes be overwhelming. That's why I think there is the need for strong leadership uh, and representation from the District of Columbia. Uh, and, and we've traditionally had that. Um, you know, whether our surrounding jurisdictions like it or not, we are, the DC is the anchor of the, of the Metropolitan Transit uh, Network. Uh, and I think Lucinda and Tom actually uh, bring a mentality to this position, to this appointment that will continue to make the anchor role relevant. Then talk a little bit about the equity issue. It's one of the issues that, that will keep coming up and came up during my time, I'm sure during uh, Dan's time of service uh, on, the, on the board uh, and having strong voices to ensure that residents of the District of Columbia could have good access to buses uh, and trains at reliable hours uh, is critical. You know, I, I said in my testimony that Lucinda was really part of the architecture that helped businesses pivot during the COVID-19 pandemic so that, it, so that restaurants, for example, can use the streeteries and, 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 and sidewalks. Uh, at a time when WMATA is constantly seeking to cut services in the District of Columbia, particularly late night services uh, that affect uh, some of our lowest income earners, uh, we need a strong voice like Lucinda to push back uh, or at least be rational uh, about it. And so I am pleased uh, that we're gonna have that voice uh, in Ms. Vapors. How effective can the board be in taming the Metro, the WMATA bureaucracy, if it needs to be tamed. But we know that there have been some challenges uh, there. Dan, Neil? Yeah, you know, you know, WMATA is not unlike other bureaucracies. Dan had the pleasure or the curse of running it for nine months. I think it was a pleasure. Um, but we have a really great general manager uh, today. Uh, who is who doesn't suffer fools lightly? Uh, does has, in, in my estimation, has, has showed a disdain for you know an over over bureaucratic uh, organization. The board, however, has great oversight and opportunity to inform uh, the general manager on how the bureaucracy could be tamed. Uh, so I would. You know, I just don't. I don't want the board to overstep its boundaries and think that you know its role is to supervise the day-to-day -day operations. Is to really just provide input to a really great general manager that Momada now has. It had a good one when Dan was there, also. But just just using its policy role to to help shape the bureaucracy and not trying to run the organization. Yeah, I, I would just like to echo what 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 Neil said uh, about the role of the board. And I frankly think actually the best way to quote unquote tame the bureaucracy is frankly to give support to the general manager to innovate. And I frankly think that um, the, the biggest uh, problem I found um, when I was working 
as the, as the interim general manager was that there wasn't a lot of support, not from the staff. The staff were willing to try and experiment and, and, and test. It was actually the board that was more uh, nervous about um, uh, innovation. And so frankly, I think it's really the role of the board to give the general manager room to work with the staff to experiment and test and find ways to find savings and, and, and innovate in service provision. Was it a, a fear on the part of the board or hesitancy in the part of the board or did the board members just lack that um, creativity? Um, I, I, you know, I, I've, I've thought a lot about this. I think there's, there's, um, you know, there was, uh, there was regional dynamics. Now this was 20, 2006. So let's remember this was 15 years ago and things have uh, changed uh, quite a bit in the region. And I believe at WMATA, uh, in part through the leadership of Paul Wiedefeld, in part through um, some changes on the board, um, in part through, frankly, WMATA dealing with some much more difficult situations. When I was there, ridership was growing. Um, WMATA has made huge progress in, in identifying consistent funding sources. Um, and, it's, and it's in a world now where it really does need to explore um, new and innovative ways of delivering services. I think the conversation about equity has gotten so much stronger, so much louder, and frankly, so much more important that that is also creating room Having folks like Lucinda, who's demonstrated over a career that she's willing to, as a leader, take chances uh, and explore new ways of delivering services and, and willing to say, well, that didn't work, let's go back. I actually think that that's the kind of support that a, a general manager like Paul Wiedefeld uh, will benefit from as he has to navigate these much more complicated operating waters. Yeah, I, I agree with everything Dan said. I, I do think the board has really evolved and matured uh, from the days Dan and I served on the board where there was, you know, intramural squabbling at every level. Um, I think this board, from my observation, work uh, much better together. I think the federal government's uh, role in it a few years ago has helped to kind of rationalize roles and help people understand uh, their fiduciary responsibilities much better. And I think when, no disrespect to my colleagues who I serve with, but back then I'm not sure that folks understood the distinction between their fiduciary responsibilities and running the organization. So, you know, Paul has, the general manager now has a much better board to deal with. And I think it can only get better with Lucinda's addition to, to that number. I'm going to try one more time from a slightly different angle. So one of the concerns that we have, when I say we, I'm, think, I'm talking about the council, but I think the region and we know the um, Federal Department of Transportation has been safety. Uh, so we now have the Metro Safety Commission, which has uh, issued some reports and they seem to be critical of uh, progress with safety, improving safety. Um, we also, we in this case as the council are concerned about um, the Metro police and how they have been policing uh, in, in, from the standpoint of the issues that we're dealing with uh, nationally, you know, over policing, uh, unnecessary use of force and so forth. Can the board really make a difference in either of these areas? And if so, what could the board be doing? And I'm not asking for criticism, or maybe I'm asking for constructive suggestion. What can the board be doing so that Metro is more effective, both with regard to safety and uh, police? Well, I, I actually think that that is a place where the Metro board can play a very strong role in creating clear guidance, expectations, goals, and oversight. Um, not digging in onto the the you know the 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 deep operational details. I mean, one of the things that that, that um, would drive us to distraction operationally is how much in the way of uh, incremental decision-making that the board had to get involved in. And they would lose the forest of what the goals of the, the authority were, what the, what the big challenges facing the authority were for the trees of these you know, tiny little um, decision-making processes. And I think that in many ways, it's really up to the board itself to decide where it wants to engage 
in the suite of decisions that the um, uh, that the uh, that the that the board involves itself in. And I frankly think, you know, technically they have one authority to hire and manage a general manager who's then responsible for meeting the goals that they set. And I frankly think that that is something that that every board needs to remind themselves of. And and WMATA could benefit from doing that. I, I think that if if the board decided that they really wanted to focus on how are we going to provide a strong safety culture and accountability around that culture and how are we going to provide a, a oversight about what our expectations about the public safety operations of components of Metro were, that that would be an, a critical role of the board. And I think that they could be incredibly influential. Yeah, I, I, agree, I agree with that. And I think the most important role in public safety the board can make is sort of set, helping set policy um, that's really guided by their experiences. Uh, Lucinda has you know, a tremendous amount of experience here in the District of Columbia that can inform that process. I must say, speaking specifically about Metro Police, and I have the opportunity of partnering with them on a regular basis. You could not ask for a more professional group of men and women uh, to, to work with. They understand the communities that they're dealing with. Uh, they're, you know, in my five years at the downtown bid, they have not just built, but strengthened their partnerships uh, with us and the businesses, particularly in Chinatown Gallery Place. But I do think the role of the board is sort of setting the right policy just based on their experiences that will help shape the direction of security in WMATA. Yeah, Ramando, so can I can I just speak to the question of policing very briefly? Sure. Um, I don't have the experience of uh, Mr. Tangelino, Mr. Albert, but I would say that what I've come to learn about the Wamada Board is that it is a very interesting board, and that it is not like a corporate board. It, its members are responsible to varying interests, and on the issue of policing, I think. The board has led, um, for example, the establishment of the um, MTPD um, investigations review panel, and that being comprised of a majority of civilians. I think that's an area in which the board led. Um, but I think more broadly, the board does have an oversight responsibility. Um, it has a responsibility to ensure that particularly Metro Transit Police, and I'll say the general manager, are working um, in accordance with what the respective need, you know, the, the jurisdictions need and the region as a whole needs. But on this issue of policing, I would caution, um, and I think our membership would caution this idea that simply setting policy and letting it run is the way to go. We need more oversight over police because what we've seen over the course of the last year, let alone decades of history, is that this approach that we can just let police do what they want, and you know, there, you if you you know empower leadership to 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 in theory correct for bad behavior, it will happen. We see over and over again. I just happened upon a story in which a, a, a woman's teeth was knocked out. I think it's the second instance. I've read of MTPD um, bringing some harm to someone. So I would just caution that, at least on policing, that we can, the board should um, step back from doing oversight and step, lean into doing oversight over the police the department. Can I, if you wouldn't mind, I, I would just say that I don't, I don't think Mr. Thompson and I actually in disagreement about that. I actually think a board that recognizes that their goal, that their job is to set specific goals, expectations, and oversight, and to hold leadership accountable is really their job. Um, so I, I think actually that's why it's important to have people who have depth of experience in operations, who have understanding of how big organizations work and systems work so that they can have stronger ability to ask you know, deeper questions about things like discipline, things like um, uh, expectations, things like process and systems and accountability. So I, I, I just like to say that I, I agree with Mr. Thompson and, and I think that that's an important and critical role for the board and its board members. 
Uh, thank you. I'm going to move to the uh, nominees at this point. I want to thank each of you, Mr. Thompson, Mr. Tangulini, Mr. Albert, for your time, your testimony, and allowing me to explore a little bit beyond the um, nominees to the uh, issues that are important to the district. So you're each excused. I do have copies of your statements. Uh, Mr. Tangulini, I had it, and I didn't know I had it. So that was my bad. Thank you, each of you. And we will now hear from um, the nominees, Lucinda Babers and uh, Thomas Bolger. Uh, Ms. Babers, you want to go first, and good morning. Good morning, Chairman Mendelson. Good morning, Chairman Mendelson and members of the Committee of the Whole. I am Lucinda Babers, Deputy Mayor in the Office of the Deputy Mayor for Operations and Infrastructure, commonly referred to as DEMOIS. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on my nomination as a principal member the Board of Directors of the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, WMATA. I also want to thank Dan Tangerlini and Neil Albert for testifying in support of my nomination. And I also want to include um, Mr. Thompson. As former District of Columbia City Administrators, Dan and Neil's leadership and guidance were crucial to shaping my leadership abilities. Metro gets you there. That has been my slogan to family, colleagues, and friends during my more than 20 years of living in the Washington metropolitan area. Whether going to work, meeting friends for brunch, or heading out for shopping, my question is whether my destination is near a Metro stop. Pre-pandemic, I was a daily Metro Rail rider. I first started riding Metro by driving to the Shady Grove Red Line Rail Station parking and boarding the train along with hundreds of other commuters. I quickly became familiar with how early to show up to snag a parking space, train etiquette, how to transfer throughout the system and the use of various trip planning apps. All of my housing moves were based on having a Metro stop within walking distance. I rode the rails at various times, including running from a work assignment at the DC jail to the stadium armory station at 11.50 p.m. to catch the last train home. And yes, my weekend shopping trips were longer due to 20 minutes or more headways, but I didn't mind because Metro gets you there. I have not just ridden WMATA rails, I have also frequented the bus. I love the gentle bouncing that comes with riding the bus. On my way to doctor appointments in the Department of Motor Vehicles, former Penn Branch and current Georgetown locations, I had the opportunity to gaze out at district neighborhoods I have never visited while riding the bus. Based on my vast years of Metro Rail and bus riding, I have had the opportunity to view and experience WMATA's customer service. I have also helped residents and tourists navigate the landscape of transit riding. Due to my experience, I plan to focus my board participation on ensuring district residents receive equitable and reliable service balanced by safety and supported by the budget. Please allow me to take a moment to provide more specifics on what I will advocate for on behalf of the district if I am appointed to the WMATA board. I will advocate for the extension of late night bus and rail service and look for innovative ways to pay for it. I will demand equitable district transit service, which often means maintaining and expanding bus service in Ward 7 and 8. I will call out the need for equitable discounted fares for transfers, regardless of whether a rider uses a smart trip card. I will mandate that WMATA spends its budget dollars in the district whenever possible by using CBEs and hiring district residents. I will require that my fellow board members listen to the needs of riders, including those on the Riders Advisory Council. And I will listen to the requirements from the mayor and this city council to ensure WMATA's future direction is in line with our strategic needs. In my demois role, I will advocate for complete bus electrification, which is a must for the district to meet our clean energy goals. Also in my current role, I will prioritize more dedicated bus lanes to increase bus reliability for riders. 
Now you may wonder whether my appointment to the board will achieve any of the above objectives. I invite you to review some of my advocacy related accomplishment and projects at DCDMV. I spearheaded a project to address unbanked residents by trying to enter into agreements with check cashing establishments to place a computer printer on the premise and allow residents to purchase debit cards to access DMV online services. I also promoted DMV's 55 online services for those with internet and computer access. So walk-in services were available to those without access, thereby resulting in shorter in-person lines. Always seeking ways to bridge the digital divide, I collaborated with DC Public Libraries for them to install secure online computer access so residents without computer and internet access could do DMV transactions at their local libraries. Further, I created and managed successful ticket amnesty programs and encouraged Treasury Central Collection Unit to offer more equitable ticket payment and settlement plans to unemployed and low income residents. And finally, I created proof of residency, homelessness and returning citizen residency forms that could be used by individuals who do not have the necessary documents in their names to obtain identification. Bottom line, I have the leadership and skill set required to be a great asset to the board. As a continuation of my transportation background, I worked at Amtrak for three years. First, as the project manager for a customer service strategy, and later, the budget manager for operations. WMATA is facing similar issues I saw at Amtrak. Those issues include how to deliver quality, reliable service after stimulus funds end how to maintain and improve safety while minimizing customer impact, how to fund service expansion, such as the Silver Line expansion. What will be the future ridership and can it support continuing to run the trains and buses? How to refocus employee training to embrace the continuous use of checklists and standard operating procedures and how to make the cultural changes needed to empower and motivate the workforce to deliver service excellence. Assisting the general manager, senior leadership team and the board in solving these issues excites me and I cannot wait to get started. I recognize being a member of the WMATA board will require significant time and attention. However, I am ready for the challenge, especially since I plan to continue using both Metro Rail and Metro Bus. Therefore, I am deeply invested in ensuring we have one of the best transit systems in the nation. As the nation's capital, our residents deserve the best. In closing, I would like to thank Mayor Bowser for selecting me and you, Chairman Mendelson, for nominating me and giving me the opportunity to serve on the WMATA Board of Directors. I will now address any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Babers. I'm Mr. Bulger. Hi, Mr. Chairman. Can you, uh, is it working? Yes. Uh, good to see you again, Mr. Chairman, and uh, members of the City Council who are on this uh, Zoom call. Uh, I'm honored uh, to be reconsidered for reappointment uh, to the WMATA board. Uh, and uh, as of this July, I will have served as an alternate director for over 10 years. First, in connection with our mayor, Muriel Bowser, we were both appointed at the same time. And uh, I've seen a lot over the last 10 years. And I won't go into some of the issues that you and I have privately talked about uh, by uh, the number of years that I've served. Uh, currently, I'm the president of a federal lobbying company called Government Relations Inc. And I've been doing that since 1983. And our clients are mostly all involved in infrastructure, particularly mass transit for new starts, extensions, operating assistance, COVID relief, et cetera. Uh, 
So I have a, a lot of knowledge that, or experience, I don't know if I have knowledge, experience in the mass transit area. I have had the opportunity to back up or be as an alternate our city's uh, pr principal board members on numerous occasions when people uh, of principal uh, appointees have stepped down or were unable to attend these meetings. Recently, <clears throat> after uh, Jeff left, I've been serving uh, in his capacity uh, at the Metro Board uh, virtual meetings, which are very long, as I told Lucinda, no breaks, and uh, it's almost a whole day. So, <clears throat> Getting to some ideas uh, that I have that I think are pertinent to this hearing, uh, I have four ideas. One is we need to uh, boost rail ridership from where it is today. It's at 15 to 20 percent pre-COVID, and that is an impossible to uh, imagine. So, one idea that I would like to present or push for is. Uh, all day rail fares, for example, a $2 rail fare in the city, uh, no peak fares anymore uh, in the future, starting around Labor Day when I think businesses might come back to uh, the central core. Uh, simplify the zone system, which is impossible to dis imagine or discuss or give people uh, any information about how the zone system works. Uh, use the federal funds that we've received to stimulate rail ridership. Uh, right now in the proposed budget that we're about to approve, we're only looking at $166 million in rail fares versus $666 million pre-COVID. That's the gap. And I think the federal funds should be spent to stimulate these ideas to get the rail ridership back to some normalcy. And as mentioned, eliminate the bus to rail transfer fee, which I don't agree with. And I've been a great proponent with DC Destination, Elliot, uh, to testify to extend the late night rail service. In fact, that was the last public hearing that I went to last March where Elliot Ferguson was my witness to uh, try to get the late night service extended beyond uh, what, it, what it was proposed uh, last March. Uh, finally, you mentioned safety. It's like numero, numero one as a board member, particularly recently the, uh, the Rail Operations Center at New Carrollton is under another investigation. It never seems to be operating correctly. Uh, and then finally, I have been a proponent, along with some of my other colleagues that spoke today, about catching up on our capital asset backlog, which is in the billions. And then finally, I've chaired, and there's no current subcommittee right now, but I created a pension subcommittee to try to tackle our backlog on our pension liabilities, which is another story for another day. But uh, at least we're starting to put aside small amounts to buy down the uh, pension liabilities. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to be reappointed. I'm honored and uh, I look forward to any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Bulger, and thank you, Ms. Babers. Um, you know, my thinking here, just I, I do have some questions, but I, I want to put this out, is my thinking here is that um, we used to have four representatives to Metro, the two, two yes. members and the two alternates who were able to participate in the committees and at the board meetings and the so-called reforms that took place have... Um, altered that so that the alternates um, are, are, I guess, relegated to the audience, but have a much less role, which makes it difficult to, I think, 
to uh, find people who are willing to be the alternate because uh, you're responsible when you, the alternate, step up to fill the seat for the primary member who's absent that day, but otherwise um, you're kept out of the room, literally or figuratively, I'm not quite sure which. Um, so I've, I've appreciated your service, Mr. Bulger, because you've been on the board as our alternate for so long so that you have that uh, institutional memory that history, which I think is important. And you're not a stranger when the primary member is absent and uh, you need to step up to the, to the table. I do want, if, if you could, Mr. Bulger, to speak a bit about how active you can be these days as alternate. And I don't mean you, Mr. Bulger, I mean you as an alternate member. Okay, that question uh, was one of the things I was hoping, Mr. Chairman, we could get into. Uh, as you know, the Commonwealth of Virginia, through Governor McAuliffe, former Secretary Ray LaHood, decided without any basis that the board of WMATA should be shrunk. And in fact, the alternates cannot participate in any board activities, either in person or virtually. And if they do, the Commonwealth Transportation Board of Virginia will, shall, I'll read the, the, the uh, legislation, shall withhold 20% of the funds available uh, under the Virginia Code if any alternates participate or take action at any official Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority board meeting or committee meeting as board members, except if there's an absentee. So what's happened is, and this is my personal opinion, Mr. Chairman, the Commonwealth of Virginia has prescribed to the District of Columbia, as well as Maryland, my, and I've talked to my colleagues from Maryland, a very undemocratic requirement. Uh, with that said, uh, when COVID started and we were rep, rep uh, racked with decision-making, I suggested that we needed all hands on deck, not just eight principal members and the alternates are in the showers. Uh, that's just the phrase I use. And that we needed everyone to pull their weight. And uh, unless the Commonwealth of Virginia changes the alternate requirement, uh, I have found it very difficult uh, to represent the District of Columbia uh, when you don't get to participate in any of the meetings and then all of a sudden in the case of Jeff Marudian uh, going to the Biden administration, a whole year went by where I was unable to participate, but then I had to come up to speed like overnight uh, for the last couple months. So I find this to be impossible sometimes, but I've managed to hold the line best I can. You're able to, Mr. Bulger, you're able to attend the meetings but not participate? No, no. There's no participation requirement. I can't attend the meetings. Uh, they're very strict about it. But the, our, council, uh, our corporate board secretary and I have had conversations about what, whether I can or can't, and it's no. I'm not unable to participate. Okay, uh, let me ask each of you, I asked these questions uh, for every nomination. Uh, I may have asked these in the pre-hearing questions that we sent you. Uh, for each of you, are you current in your taxes that you owe to the district or to the federal government? Ms. Babers? Yes. Mr. Bolger? I couldn't hear the question, Mr. Chairman. Could you repeat, please? I'm sorry. Are you current in your taxes that you owe to the district and to the federal government? Uh, yes, and I'm going to get a, a district uh, check. Very small. Okay. <laughs> you didn't have to volunteer that, but okay. <laughs> Do you have the time to serve, Ms. Babers? Yes. Uh, Mr. Bulger? Yes, and Lucinda and I have talked uh, prior to uh, this about a month ago, and I tried to explain to her the time constraints uh, as a helpful hint. And the answer is yes. 
Um, and then I always ask of nominees, regardless of the board or commission, uh, if there are any conflicts of interest in whether and what you would do if there were conflicts of interest. Um, Mr. Bolger, you're familiar with the WMATA has its own conflict of interest or inter conflicts of interest and ethics code. Ms. Babers, I assume you sort of know what it is for WMATA. In any event, do you know of any conflicts of interest that you might have and what would you do if you did, Ms. Babers? I don't have any conflicts of interest, but if one um, came up, I would recuse myself from whatever the particular issue was. And I would also probably want to make sure that I am um, in good standing and, and, you know, doing what is proper. So I may want to get the advisement from the um, WMATA's general counsel or some other legal um, advisement. Mr. Bulger? I currently have no conflict of interest. The WMATA ethics report that we have to file every year is extensive, like 20 pages of uh, information that you have to swear to uh, and including my uh, my wife who works for a hotel and, and that, like if, if WMATA ever used her corporate hotel I, I doubt that that would happen but I have to put my wife down as well on our ethics report. Okay uh, how do you this is for each of you how do you intend to balance your fiduciary duty to WMATA with your duty to represent the district. Uh, I'll let Mr. Bolger go first and then Ms. Babers. Uh, that has been a uh, long-standing question. It, it's a two-headed monster if you can. Uh, you, we both, you have to represent both the District of Columbia and WMATA simultaneously. Okay, Ms. Babers. So chairman, as you know, the district government provides approximately $820 million a year, um, both operating and capital to um, WMATA. So absolutely, you know, I am going to always look at um, the fiduciary responsibility and budgetary issues from both sides. Whereas as board of directors, we're responsible for approving the budget and um, it is necessary that we provide WMATA with um, funding necessary to run the railroad and run the bus service. But on the other side, the District of Columbia, um, we have a limited amount of money to make available to WMATA while we still um, have unique needs um, from it. So similar to, um, to Tom, it's gonna be a balancing act, but I am going to always look at both sides. Um, Ms. Babers, in your statement, you spoke about electric buses and supporting that initiative. Uh, I don't know if you know this, uh, the council, all 13 members of the council co-introduced a resolution, I believe on Monday. We haven't voted on it yet, but all 13 co-introduced it to calling on WMATA to move as quickly as possible or quicker to electrify its bus system. Do you want to add any additional comments and then I'll ask Mr. Bulger? Well, Chairman, as you know, part of the Clean Energy Act that the council passed um, some years ago is to electrify not only WMATA's fleet, but district government's fleet and then move forward with, you know, private um, citizens. And so the Department of Energy and Environment is in my cluster and I am very committed to ensuring that we move forward on our clean energy goals. So absolutely anything we can do to accelerate any um, environmental components, both in the district government and WMATA, I am willing to push for. Mr. Bolcher. Okay, this issue has come up uh, in the last couple of months and Stephanie and I have been arguing that at 12 electric buses at WMATA as a pilot program isn't sufficient. Uh, and that we need to go back to the drawing board to find out what the other infrastructure requirements at the, at the garages will require or are required so we can increase the number of electric buses. 
so that's ongoing. We're awaiting uh, feedback from the WMATA staff about charging facilities, uh, maintenance facilities uh, at existing garages. And then we're renovating or about to start renovating the, uh, the historic garage on 14th Street, Upper 14th Street, and we make sure that when we re redo that garage, uh, we put the necessary infrastructure in place as well as increase the number of electric buses. It's a, it's a little more complicated than just buying buses. I appreciate uh, what you said. Um, it reminds me that we had an oversight hearing with uh, Mr. Wiedefeld a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And I was feeling a little bit of frustration. Years ago, many years ago, I was very active as a young at-large council member pushing for conversion from diesel to CNG for the buses. And WMATA was very reluctant about any, cha any change. And I think they're still reluctant about any change. But with the CNG buses, there was a legitimate question about infrastructure. How do you uh, um, acquire a store and then dispense pressurized uh, compressed natural gas? Right. Uh, fuel, so it can explode. Um, it's it's complicated. Now I don't want to oversimplify this, but electric buses, basically, when you refuel them, you plug them in. Right. So you need the heavy up electrical supply, but that's what you need is the heavy up electrical supply. You don't have storage challenges. You don't have safety precautions against explosions of compressed natural gas. Um, with regard to the buses, we're seeing other cities, I think Los Angeles is the largest that is the fastest with converting to electric buses. There's a legitimate question regarding range uh, and therefore um, what's necessary for recharging the buses, but this isn't complicated. And I, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, did not feel that I was getting a sense from the general manager at our hearing that there was as much enthusiasm for trying out this new technology. I shouldn't say trying out with transitioning to this new technology that uh, we can be certain we're gonna to have to go to as we uh, deal with sustainability, climate change. And if I could say something, Mr. Chairman, about that, this add on to your wonderful comment. Uh, we have been getting storm, stonewalled a little bit, and we told WMATA staff to go get in contact with TriMet in Portland, Oregon, who partnered with their electric utility company and produced a great partnership. And I think I, I, I'm waiting for them to tell me if we have an overture to PEPCO as a partner. And I think if we did, I think we could accelerate electric bus Buses. Secondly, Mr. Chairman <clears throat> and others, every year we uh, get asked to approve 100 new buses that have reached their life expectancy, whether they're CNG or clean diesel, doesn't matter. It's always 100 buses. And so there's two questions about that. Can we get more electric buses to replace older buses? And the second question is, do we need 100? Do we need 50 new buses or, or do we have to stick with 100 every year? That's still on the table. Chairman, if, I'm sorry, if I could add, just yesterday I was in a meeting with Interim um, Department of Transportation Director Everett Lott and we talked about exactly what you're speaking about, the infrastructure for electrification because we were talking about the, um, the new bus um, um, facility for circulator. And of course, um, DDOT has 14 electric buses on order and eventually that number is supposed to increase to a total of 30. And so this would be the facility that houses them. And so we talked about, you know, how are we going to do the charging in between as the buses travel from um, one side of the city to the other. And uh, we talked about whether or not we had done outreach to WMATA so that we can partner with WMATA because of course 
we've got the circulator, they've got Metro buses, we need to come together. And so that's one of the things that I have directed um, interim director Lott to begin to do. And I did share with him and said, hopefully if I'm appointed to the board, I can help facilitate, um, you know, him meeting and um, us coming together and collaborating and building charging stations that can be utilized by um, both organizations. I'll also say that, um, you know, as the Department of Public Works, which is also in the Demois cluster, has um, a mandate and they've been given funds to also do charging stations. And so they're moving forward. And then of course, PEPCO, which is also in Demois cluster as oversight. Um, we have been talking to them about um, the fact that we are moving away from from gas and towards electric. And we've been talking about their grid and, you know, are we gonna potentially have any of the issues that Texas had um, when they had the, um, the storm and the fact that we're going to be putting charging stations all over the city. And so, you know, they assured us that their electrification plan was being done to support the increased needs of the city. So, um, so I look forward to utilizing um, all the agencies that I have oversight with to make sure that WMATA um, can collaborate and get what they need. So let me change the subject, um, safety. I have the sense as an outsider that the Metro Safety Commission has been getting a bit frustrated that it's issuing recommendations and finding that uh, there are, um, how do I want to put this, continuing unresolved safety issues with Metro. Now, I believe they look at Metro Rail, not Metro Bus, uh, and any of, but, but safety is important for both. Um, do you have views, this is for both of you, on how the board can push the authority to do more and more quickly with regard to improving safety? Which well, one of you wants to go first? I'm going to go first, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Okay, so something that uh, you should know and others, the Safety Commission, we've never met with them. I have urged meetings to just get to know the new Safety Commission as well as uh, the airport authority. We don't cross fertilize each other at all. All right, so the Safety Commission, from what we've been told by our safety staff, are moving in a regulatory position rather than an oversight. They, they are expanding their regulatory function and that's somewhat different from what they were, their charter. Um, we had a great briefing about a month ago about the staff is looking into why rail operators go through red, red lights uh, on a frequent basis and what we should be doing about it. And, it, and it's, it's their opinion that it's this lack of sleep, uh, redundancy, uh, not, not something that they do on purpose. And so they're looking into all kinds of psychological reasons why rail operators mess up which was enlightening to me because we have never heard that kind of a briefing before. Yes, so Chairman Mendelson, I have read with interest in the, um, in the paper, in the media, the reports from the Safety Commission on, especially on the um, Rail Operations Command Center in um, New Carrollton and how there are significant safety concerns. And one of the things I believe that the board of directors can be helpful with is just making sure that basic recommendations are being put um, in front of the general manager and his senior leadership, um, such as how are the um, employees trained? Are they trained to utilize checklists and standard operating procedures and to do that every time? Do they have tablets or do they use their smartphones to do these checklists so that immediately after they complete their checklist and hit enter, that information is automatically captured and the managers know that that checklist has been done. 
I, I view it in terms of not only when I was at Amtrak, who had a similar, of course, command center, but also in terms of a pilot getting ready to, to um, fly a plane. They must do every checklist and they must do it consistently and continuously and um, management stays after them. And if they don't do it, then they can lose their right to to fly and it can impact the entire airline. I just think that the board of directors need to assist in putting that kind of urgency um, into safety such that if we don't get this right, then maybe we shouldn't be running a, a rail system or a bus system so that people can understand just how important it is. And, um, and I believe that the union should also be at the table if they're not currently at the table <coughs> when we are discussing um, safety concerns so that they can go out and advocate on behalf of WMATA to the workforce to make sure that if it's a, if it is an issue such as Tom indicated, such as not getting enough sleep, then what are the issues? Are, are, we, are we working people back to back over time, 12 hour shifts or something, which is something that probably shouldn't be done. So, so I do believe that we can help and give the um, general manager um, just some additional guidance um, for them to look at. If I could just add on, Mr. Chairman, a, a lot of the safety uh, issues are in the yards early, 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 early in the morning, like four o'clock in the morning, and where they're moving trains around. Uh, that's where most of the safety mishaps, we've been told anyway, are, have occurred. So it's not like they're in revenue service, luckily, except for the occasionally going through red lights. Uh, I'm gonna change the subject and ask about police and what we do to, what the board can do, what you think the board can do to uh, improve the quality of policing by the Metro Transit Authority. Uh, I'll start with Tom, because you probably have more experience with this and then Ms. Babers. Okay, first of all, Mr. Chairman, the uh, police chief uh, of for Metro is, is very, uh, I think he's testified before the council recently, uh, very open to uh, recommendations and the review board that was mentioned earlier by one of the witnesses uh, has, I think some great input to give to the, our police uh, uh, chief and his, his management staff um, unfortunately, uh, I, has, I, I have not been that active in this area because I was not active as a board member uh, a year or so ago. So I really can't add mu mu much more to that. Ms. Babers. Thank you, Chairman Mendelson. So I absolutely believe that the board of directors should be um, involved in providing any necessary guidance to the um, general manager and his senior leadership as it relates to the Metro Police. We need to be looking at the Metro Police just like we're looking at police departments all over this country in light of the George Floyd incident. And we need to refocus police departments, including the Metro Police Department, on critical functions that they should be doing and getting them out of the business of doing things that perhaps station managers and maybe ambassadors can do such as eating on the train, uh, littering, you know, they should be focused on ensuring that safety such as robberies, burglaries, more important um, crime, criminal activity um, is prevented and, um, and addressed if it occurs. This is going to be extremely critical as we try to bring ridership back to both Metro and the buses after the pandemic, because a lot of people, not only are they not feeling safe as it relates to the coronavirus, but um, some people are not feeling safe as it relates to riding the train. And that could be because we're hearing about increased um, criminal activity, real criminal activity, not, not you know, eating and, and things of that nature. But, um, but yes, I think we should focus them on what is important and, um, and not concern ourselves with um, things that other WMATA personnel could handle. If I could add to what Lucinda said, 
Mr. Chairman, the, the, the biggest thing that I've been told anyway uh, for the police is fare evasion, where the station managers just let people, and I've seen it firsthand when at nighttime uh, with the police chief, uh, where the, the kids, the, the students, our students just go right through the gate because we gave them a, a, a fare card. And then recently the city uh, extended their fare usage to uh, unlimited. So what they were, the, the school kids are doing is they were saving up their fare balances so they could go use the rail system pre COVID to go shopping. And uh, so, and fare evasion is a big deal in terms of how much money we get from the federal government because there's a big formula called Section 15 that calculates ridership along with a bunch of other factors. And that's how we get a block grant funding. So uh, just to let you know that it's, it's, it's a big, fare evasion is a big deal. Well, I just wanna, and that some of that kids ride free fare evasion is really our fault, the district government's fault. Because in many cases um, in the past, we provided them with smart trip cards, which um, did not work when they tried to tap it. And so we told them, well, then just go through because they had to get to school. And also um, the cart distribution, perhaps they didn't get their cart in a timely manner. And so school started and they didn't have a card. And so they, they went through. So I will say that the um, Department of Transportation is working with both the public school system and the charter schools to do a much better job this year in trying to get those smart trip cards into the children's hands. And we're impressing upon them that they must tap the card and mm -hmm. that gate open so that they can go through and that they should just not walk around because that information got out, I think in the past just walk around and you don't have to tap your card because we don't know if it's working or not. So I think that we as a government um, is doing a better job this year with trying to get that and communicate that so that we can decrease fair evasion, but it's never gonna totally go away. It's in every system. Couple, couple more questions. Um, the Washington Area Bus Transformation Project has come out with a number of recommendations. So uh, what's your view of them, Ms. Babers? So right when I think I took this um, position um, in Demois, the bus transformation um, group was finalizing its recommendations. And I think that they are some sound recommendations. They are some recommendations, however, that come with, with funding requirements. And I think one of the biggest issues that we're gonna have that we have always had as the district is how do we fund the amount of bus service that we are saying we need to make sure that our residents can get to where they go. So like I said, that's gonna be one of the things that I try to focus on is where can, how can we be more innovative to actually increase the bus service because we may want increased bus service in the district, but um, based on my conversations, I did have conversation prior to this hearing with all of the principals on the board of directors and they were open, they were honest, they shared with me um, where they thought Metro was heading and they, they flat out indicated that, you know, it's the district, you all are the ones who, who need more bus service and, and we not so much. So there's always gonna be that tension um, but they said that they're willing to work with us and collaborate as long as we can, you know, collaborate them on some of the things that they want, such as, of course, the expansion of the silver line. So um, I support the recommendations. It's just a matter of how do we fund them? Thank you, Mr. Bulger. Well, I was involved initially on the bus transformation project uh, uh, pre-COVID, Mr. Chairman, and uh, worked collaboratively with uh, the chairman of the initiative and the consultants, Boston Consulting Group, Rich Davies. And one of the things that came up in initially was how to entice the other bus operators to play ball. And we've got, you know, quite a few other bus operators like Rideon in Montgomery County, Dash in Alexandria, 
et cetera, et cetera, to collaborate and come up with a much more regional approach. And since we have, the district has more, more, uh, more of a stake in this, that, that was an initial challenge. I, I don't know, I, again, I've been out of bounds. I don't know how the other jurisdictions are uh, welcoming this. I think we did initially was, we were provide funding for the project as a carrot to get them to, to, t to the table. But at this point, I can't add any more to that uh, initiative. Um, my last question is gonna be regarding the uh, proposed budget, WMATA's proposed FY 2022 budget. Now, um, I'm assuming Ms. Babers, you're somewhat familiar with it because uh, you're overseeing DDOT and working with, um, I think, Stephanie and so forth. Um, and Mr. Bolger, you should be aware of it as well. And maybe it's in flux because of the federal funding. Some changes are being made. But I think my question is, what are your observations regarding the proposed WMATA budget where the, we need to make some changes? Ms. Babers? Yes, thank you for that question. So, you know, as everyone is aware, WMATA's FR22 budget was going to be absolutely horrendous until right. um, they received the American um, plan um, stimulus information. And it looks like perhaps WMATA is going to receive about maybe a billion dollars for um, FR22. And so they're going to be able to maintain um, current service but they had put on the table, you know, um, a reduction in force of like 2,500 um, people, um, cutting, significantly cutting bus lines, emerging bus lines. And of course that would have the most impact on district, on the district government. They were going to um, cut back uh, night service. I mean, it's already not to its full potential of where it was um, pre-COVID, but they were gonna you know, take it back to like nine o'clock um, or maybe even later for both rail and buses. If if they had to move forward with that budget, our ability to recover from the pandemic would we just wouldn't have been able to do it. Um, we wouldn't have been able to get our hospitality um, workers to and from their work. Um, it would it would have greatly greatly impacted. So, so we're, we're, we're thankful for the American Rescue Plan, but like I said in my testimony, we're concerned because what happens after the FY22 budget and after the stimulus funds are um, expended? Is the ridership gonna be back or we're gonna be back where we have the necessary funding in order to continue WMATA on the path that it needs to be in order to support our economy. So, so now I think we need to look forward. The board needs to look forward at FY23 and try to go ahead and imagine what is that going to be in terms of, of budgetary um, issues. Mr. Bolger. Okay. Um, I agree with Lucinda. It's uh, re restoration of the FY22 budget seems to be uh, on its way or solid. 2023 20, is going to be a big challenge. Two things. Um, one is I've been trying to get the board to reimagine travel in 2023 um, based on a uh, study that the University of Minnesota did regarding telecommuting, uh, commercial real estate, uh, participation, uh, walking, and I don't have the answer right now, but I could. Just, I don't think we're gonna go back to pre-COVID travel for a while. It's gonna take a number of years to get back to where we were pre-COVID. Because I think people are not necessarily happy, but have figured out that they can work virtually and uh, whether their companies require them to come back to an office building, I don't know but I think we need to reimagine travel in, uh, in, in a short period of time. Secondly, uh, one of our colleagues uh, from Loudoun County who uh, 
as a county supervisor is suggesting that maybe we need to, this is his idea, go back to the Virginia legislature and figure out other funding streams that we could consider early rather than late, later. So I, I think Mr. Chairman, that might be an initiative that could start rolling out sooner than, than you would have thought. Uh, so the other, the other ideas that we were kicking around is, you know, how, how to entice people to uh, take the rail system, which has taken a beating. Uh, and we're gonna be talking about that. And the general manager has given us pre uh, ideas, not in concrete, just ideas to chew on. Uh, as I mentioned in my early testimony about reducing fares in the short run uh, et cetera, et cetera. So those things are going to be discussed uh, probably this this summer, by June, June, July. But having to ask the jurisdictions for more funding is going to be, I think, a, a challenge. Uh, they've held the line on subsidy. So there's no increase. You don't have to worry about an increase in subsidy for the district uh, in the short term. Thank you. Um, I think that's going to conclude the questions that I have for you all. If there's anything else you want to submit, and I'm not asking you to, but I'm inviting you if you want to, uh, please uh, provide it to uh, me through the uh, committee. The record in this matter, and I'm saying this for you, but also for the public, will close at 5 p.m. on April 19th, 2021. And it's possible that we will be taking this up uh, in the committee to vote on the 20th of April. Again, I wanna thank each of you. Uh, Mr. Bolger, I wanna thank you for your service because you have been on the board for quite a number of years. And uh, so I wanna thank you for that. And I wanna thank both of you for your willingness to, um, to serve uh, for new terms. And with that, I'm concluding the hearing. The time is well, five. Mr. Ch the Mr. Chairman, if I could just yes. add one final thought. I wanna tell you that the DDOT staff are excellent. Uh, we have a pre-board pre meeting. We have another one today at five o'clock. And there's, I don't know, half a dozen people or more on the, call, on the virtual call. And they have really, really stepped up to help me understand some of the stuff that I've missed. Uh, and they continue to serve uh, us in an excellent way. You should know that. Thank you. Thank you for and thank you, Tom. Thank you, Lucinda. <laughs> I'm going to try now to adjourn this. Um, here.